All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, very much welcome to this uh, 89th Stockholm Seminar on Japan. And it is in, indeed a good time to uh, discuss Japan uh, at this specific date due to the new uh, cabinet being presented of Japan's new Prime Minister, Suga, recently. And uh, all of us uh, who are watching Japan are very much interested to see how uh, Prime Minister Suga will develop Japan's domestic economic situation, pandemic response, but also Japan's foreign policy. And whether this will signify a continuation of Abe Shinzo's foreign policy. But today we will go even further back to look at some broad trends in Japan's leadership in security multilateralism in East Asia. And we are extremely happy to have uh, two colleagues discussing this topic today. First of all, Professor Paul Midford from uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Um, and Paul uh, is a longtime friend of UI and of uh, Stockholm, unfortunately. We can't have you here today in person, but very good that you uh, so kindly agreed to uh, present your new book that came out uh, this summer. And in this new book called Overcoming Isolationalism, Paul explores the questions and offer a corrective to a common misperception that Japan's security strategy is reactive to US pressure and unresponsive to developments among Japan's neighbors. Um, and then we also have uh, Dr. Ulf Hansen. Ulf is a lecturer at Soka University in Japan and an associate research fellow at UI. And uh, like Paul, Ulf has been doing research on Japan's foreign and security policy for many years. So uh, thanks a lot for joining you as well, Ulf. My pleasure. Um, and the Stockholm Seminars on Japan uh, is jointly organized by the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, Stockholm School of Economics, Stockholm University, and the Swedish Defense University. And mm -hmm. my name, I forgot to say it in the beginning, is Björn Jeden, and I'm head of the Asia program at UI. So after that brief introduction, I will leave the word to you, Paul, to present your very interesting book. After that, Ulf will offer some uh, comments and uh, questions. And after that, we will bring, bring in everyone in the audience for a Q&A. So already now, if you have questions to Paul or to Ulf, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. And then during the Q&A session, I will pick questions and post them to the speakers. So thanks a lot to everyone for joining and please Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, if I can. Uh, uh, okay, wait a minute. It says I can't share the screen, the host needs to share it. I don't know what, what to do. Um, I was gonna share a PowerPoint, is that possible? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is a technical issue. Should I just like, right. PowerPoint or what? So, so uh, Paul, I think that we made you the host now. So if you please could try okay. again to, to share okay. your screen and let's see if it works. Okay, uh, no, okay. Um, uh, okay, it's, um, now I'm getting something about whether all the panelists uh, can, uh, it or not. Let me just try that again. Um, okay, there we go. Okay, I got it. Uh, sorry for that little technical glitch. Okay, so <clears throat> um, uh, the, the, the real heart of this book is about um, uh, something that happens in 1991, a, a sharp pivot in Japan's regional strategy that has really not gotten as much attention as I certainly think it should get. Uh, the Nakayama proposal of 1991. That's really the heart of the book. So the book kind of looks at what leads up to that, the very detailed case study of that um, uh, pivot, and then kind of the implications moving forward over uh, more than a quarter of a century. So basically this book uh, com uh, consists of three puzzles, uh, as you can see here. So why during the Cold War did Japan pursue a regional 
a strategy of regional security isolationism, which uh, I'll explain a bit more later, including rejection of regional security multilateralism, which I'll call abbreviate RSM from now, and why on the cusp of the Cold War's end in July 1991, did Japan suddenly reverse years of opposition, uh, steadfast opposition to RSM and propose East Asia's first region-wide multilateral security forum? And why has Japan uh, continued to, uh, to champion regional security multilateralism since 1991? So those are the three core questions of this book. And I have basically three hypotheses answering the book, answering these, uh, these uh, questions, uh, puzzles of the book. Now, the overall answer I have is reassurance. Um, that's the main hypothesis. Japan pursued security isolationism as a reassurance strategy during the Cold War, essentially, uh, uh, it tried to reassure other Asian countries it wouldn't become a security threat by keeping the SDF at home and uh, uh, by basically isolating the SDF, not even really discussing regional security. Um, now, after the Cold War, Japan used regional security multilateralism as a tool to help it expand its involvement in regional and global security while simultaneously in, uh, reassuring uh, its uh, uh, neighboring Asian countries. So, in effect, uh, um, isolationism, reassurance uh, helps us to understand the isolationism Japan pursued during the Cold War and also why it later at the end of the Cold War, uh, that same motivation led it to change its policy. Now, secondary uh, reasons or hypotheses I focus on include the mo uh, to mo uh, moderate or ameliorate the alliance security dilemma of entrapment or abandonment vis-a-vis -vis its uh, American ally and also to develop new uh, utilities underprovided by the Japan-US alliance, such as counter piracy, uh, disaster relief, counter terrorism. Uh, it can also be a tool for competing with China, particularly politically uh, in the region. So uh, when I talk about Japan's security isolationism, um, uh, I mean that Japan avoided security contacts with all other countries except the US. So Japan's security was entirely centered on its relationship with the US. You could almost, we have this term, you know, sakoku in Japanese for like a closed country. Japan was closed to foreign uh, trade and commerce. With the exception of, of the Dutch and a few other minor exceptions. And Paul, we, Paul sorry, I, I think your voice disappeared there for five seconds, at least uh, on my computer. So could you just please repeat the last sentence again? Okay, uh, why don't I just, yeah. Talk about Sakoku again. So Sakoku is this term that means a closed country during the Edo era Japan was closed to foreign trade and commerce and um, Except uh, for the Dutch and a few other minor exceptions and this almost looks similar in the sense that Japan isolated itself from any security contacts with any other country with the sole exception of the United States um, so, for example, Japan began participating in the RIM PAC or RIM of the Pacific multilateral naval exercise at the beginning of the 1980s. Um, this is sponsored by the US. Um, but for Japan, this was always a bi until the mid 1990s, this was a bilateral exercise in close proximity to a multilateral one. Japan uh, would send the, uh, its uh, uh, Maritime Self Defense Force uh, contingent to RIM PAC but they would only exercise bilaterally with the US. They would not exercise or come in contact with other navies. In fact, the US Navy would always divide itself into two parts for RIMPAC, one to exercise with the uh, Japanese and the other to exercise with everybody else. And that continued until after, until the mid 1990s. And that's, I think, a, a clear indication of this kind of security isolationism I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and just as a side note, in terms of uh, you know, what we think about in terms of public opinion or policy uh, in Japan. Um, it's often referred to as a kind of pacifism, but I actually think it's uh, what the, the sum of, of Japanese policy can be described more as this security isolationism, plus what I've described in an earlier book as kind of defensive realist attitudes about military force is not totally rejected by the Japanese government or the public. Uh, it has utility for defending national territory, but that's all. And then what Thomas Berger calls this culture of anti-militarism, and that that is the sum of those things is uh, what we often see as post-war pacifism, but security isolationism, or this idea that Japan literally can be a security island with very little contact with the rest of the world was an important part of that, I would argue. Now, Japan also opposed regional security multilateralism. It's um, 
security isolationism uh, from Tokyo's perspective uh, prevented it from meaningfully participating. Um, one reason. Another is that Japan opposed so-called confidence building measures, um, at the time mostly kind of military to military measures um, to reduce the uh, threat of uh, accidental uh, war or accidental use of force, um, in part because it, it feared self-identifying itself as a threat. It was concerned um, that if it had confidence building measures, say with South Korea, that would, it would in some sense be self-defining uh, de itself uh, as a potential threat to South Korea. So that was, that was an issue at the time, because up until that time, CBMs had only really be, been between adversaries, particularly the NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Um, also, uh, Japan opposed regional security multilateralism because of US opposition and uh, 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 precisely because of Soviet support for the idea. The Soviet Union, beginning with Leonid Brezhnev in 1969, made various collective security proposals that were aimed at reducing US era naval dominance in the region. Um, they also uh, targeted the US base network in the region. They called, among other things, for getting rid of all foreign bases, which uh, was not something the US or Japan wanted to see. I might add that there was also a concern in Japan that regional security multilateralism might ratify the uh, territorial status quo and undermine Japan's claim to the Northern Territories as well. But so for all these reasons, Japan opposed re, uh, uh, RSM. Now, um, this is just a statement by um, Sato Yukio, who at the time was in charge of policy planning in Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MOFA. He was speaking at a closed door seminar of Asia Pacific security elites in June, 1991. He's also the brains behind the Nakayama proposal month before the Nakayama proposal was made. And he has this statement where you can see in quotes, uh, maybe I won't read the whole thing, but it's, he's very clearly saying that Japan maintained a, a low uh, political um, posture uh, in, in order to avoid uh, arousing suspicion. So, and he doesn't even talk about playing a security role in this quote. I mean, that was even at that time still beyond the pale of discourse uh, in Japan and in the region. So he was just talking about playing, uh, maintaining a low political profile as a reassurance measure. And I think this is a, uh, one of the uh, more direct and kind of clear uh, acknowledgments of this policy and, and, and the kind of cause and effect that Japan saw. Uh, but if we step back 14 years before then, the Fukuda Doctrine, named after Prime, then Prime Minister Fukuda Takeo, institutionalized the security isolationism. Was effectively, he said, Japan promises not to become a military power that can attack and in, uh, invade, invade and occupy other countries. Um, and, and, and effectively, he was, he was making that promise. He was also um, saying Japan would not really be involved in regional security uh, discussions or cooperation at all. Uh, and in exchange for that, he was asking the region to accept a large and dominant economic role by Japan. At that time, Japan's economy was larger than the rest of Asia combined. Um, and it was expected that its dominance would continue to grow, plus some political role for Japan in uh, Southeast Asia and elsewhere in East Asia. So the Fukuda Doctrine was basically saying, we promise we won't become a military power, so please accept our large economic role in some uh, uh, political role as well. And, uh, you know, in, in chapter three, I examined Fukuda Takeo and how he came to this, and it's, it's obvious from his own writings and his other speeches and his role in establishing the Japan Foundation, for example, that um, he, he did see reassurance as an, uh, something Japan needed to pursue. He also uh, came to this conclusion because uh, when Japan was promoting the de uh, establishment of the Asian Development Bank, it lobbied to have the headquarters in Tokyo and uh, it lost out to Manila and he saw uh, kind of um, Japan's mis continued lingering mistrust of Japan as, as a reason for that. So, um, uh, in 1991, we have, uh, with the end of the uh, Cold War, uh, a number of things started to happen. First of all, there was a looming security vacuum in East Asia as the Soviet Union drew down its uh, regional military presence. The U.S. started drawing down its military presence in the context also of very sharp and acrimonious U.S.-Japan economic frictions and also frictions over the Gulf War. So Japan as a potential military power and threat began to loom much larger in the region. At the same time, Japan wanted to play a, a, a larger regional role. It had uh, felt very frustrated that it had been, uh, and in many ways, locked out of the Cambodian peace process, the negotiations. Um, 
And uh, Japan responded to these pressures, including US pressure that Japan start playing a larger role by joining UN uh, peacekeeping operations, sending the SDF overseas for the first time. And it proposed uh, then as well, this uh, a like-minded regional security dialogue of US allies through the uh, ASEAN Post-Ministerial Conference, PMC, uh, despite US opposition. And this was in effect an expanded security framework that was uh, uh, corresponding to Japan's uh, expanding security role from that time. And this is the Nakayama proposal of July 1991, which I say uh, is an, until the speech was given in effect, Japan's position remained regional security multilateralism is not needed. I mean, there, there were some indications before that and some of the things that um, speeches uh, that Sato uh, made or wrote, but this is really the, the, the clear break. Um, and I examine a lot of this in the book using uh, interviews and also some declassified documents. Foreign Ministry and also from the Cabinet Office. Now, um, although, uh, now to be sure, this organization ASEAN ISIS, which today people often mistake for some organization, but ASEAN Institute of Strategic and International uh, Studies uh, made its own uh, proposals for establish uh, its own proposal in particular in June 1991 in Jakarta at a meeting where actually Sato Yuki was present for establishing a regional security dialogue. Um, although it was different from uh, the Nakayama proposal of a month later, and um, uh, its proposal looks a lot more is a lot closer to what eventually becomes the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, it resembles the ARF much more than the Nakayama proposal. Nonetheless, Japan played a significant role in helping to establish the era. First of all, uh, Nakayama was the first one to make this proposal, this, uh, this specific kind of proposal, and within ASEAN security dialogue, or, or dialogue with ASEAN security partners, a security dialogue, in July 1991. So he put this on the ministerial level. Also, Japan played a big role in helping to overcome US opposition. Uh, when Nakayama made his proposal, initially uh, uh, James Baker was pretty negative. Um, uh, he, he famously said, well, if the regional security network, the heart hub and spokes network uh, ain't broke, don't fix it, was essentially what he said. Um, in fact, that's almost a direct quote. Now, nonetheless, it's also, I'd also note that Japan was somewhat ambivalent uh, about uh, the uh, emerging ARF in 1992 and 93. When you had um, subsequent um, uh, initiatives by Prime Minister Miyazawa and, that were more open to an unlike-minded forum that would involve countries other than US allies and aligned states. Um, I'd also note that Indonesia was against the whole idea of uh, just having, uh, of not including the Soviet Union or Russia, China, et cetera, uh, they because they had took neutrality and uh, non-alignment, Zopfan, uh, this zone of uh, peace and and freedom in Southeast Asia, very um, very seriously. Um, so, but you have this debate within Japan with uh, the foreign ministry, particularly the the the, uh, the, the Russian desk, the Soviet desk, Sorinka, Roshaka, being very opposed to anything that might involve Russia or the Soviet Union, and others like Miyazawa and Sato himself being more open to having a broader forum. But uh, officially, Japan was one of the last countries to actually agree to let Russia and China into this new uh, ARF. Nonetheless, once it was established, Japan was quite content because the ARF was an unlike-minded forum, um, was an unlike-minded forum, which isn't what Japan sought initially, but the PMC continued to exist as this kind of parallel security uh, forum that, uh, and dialogue that was uh, like-minded. And so Japan was satisfied with that. However, it was decided in 1995 by ASEAN by itself without consulting with Japan uh, or other dialogue partners that in 1996, the uh, PMC would admit China, Russia, and India, thereby ending the, essentially the like-minded nature of this forum. And uh, it's interesting, when you look at the documents leading up to the Nakayama proposal itself, I found that uh, Japanese diplomats were very confident they could keep Russia and China out of the PMC. Uh, but in the end, that proved not to be the case. And this also kind of challenged this special relationship that uh, Japan had built with ASEAN ever since the, the um, 
Fukuda doctrine, and Japan, I'll talk about in the next slide, responds with a, a Hashimoto doctrine to try to reestablish uh, this special relationship. So, but before that, I, I want to just kind of ask the question, some of the literature on Japan's um, re, uh, regional security multilateralism argues that Japan was losing interest in RSM and in that true? Uh, my answer is no, uh, although some like uh, Yuzawa Takeshi, who teaches at Hosei, uh, make that, made that argument in, in, some, uh, in a book and in some articles. Um, and uh, you know they argue that Japan was initially very exuberant about uh, RSM, and that this dissipated by the mid to late 1990s. Actually, my I found in talking to MOFA officials at the, at the time that they always had a kind of cautious, long-term perspective toward the RF and other forms of RF, RSM. They never expected big uh, results quickly. Uh, so I think the claim of exuberance is exaggerated. Also, it's important just to remember that MOFA had not, in the beginning, promoted an unlike security forum to begin with. They had promoted a like-minded security forum. So, um, you know, that, that's another, uh, I think, uh, qualifier to the idea that Japan was somehow losing interest. Now, the 1997 Hashimoto Doctrine was an attempt to kind of re recover uh, uh, a like-minded forum with ASEAN through creating an annual bilateral summit. Uh, it also talked about a security dialogue between ASEAN and um, Japan that wasn't realized. Uh, well, it was it was realized through the ASEAN Japan forum, but um, they wanted to kind of raise the level of that. Um, but now, interestingly, ASEAN refused, or actually, ASEAN said, "Yes, we're happy to have an annual forum with you, uh, an annual summit with you, Japan. Oh, but by the way, we're going to invite China and Russia, to, uh, China and Korea too, South Korea as well." And that is the origin of the non-like-minded ASEAN plus three or APT. So, um, now, just thinking, returning back to the uh, ASEAN regional forum and Japan's uh, continuing championing of uh, uh, regional security and multilateralism, that is what I find in the book. One real or uh, one major example of this is that at the turn of the century, Japan used the ARF to build a consensus in favor of multilateral cooperation for combating piracy. This helped to lay the groundwork then for Japan's leadership at the turn of the century in negotiating the, uh, this long-winded uh, agree uh, named agreement, Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships in Asia, so-called RECAP, and the establishment of a RECAP in Information Sharing Center, ISC, in Singapore in uh, 2007 that basically gathers uh, and shares uh, uh, information, uh, navigational information uh, uh, about uh, pirate attacks and armed robbery at sea with, uh, with member countries. It plays a reporting role. It also plays a role in, um, uh, in capacity building. It's played a role along with Japan, the EU, and others in, for example, establishing a similar uh, ISC in Djibouti and in uh, capacity building in East Asian, in East African, uh, Coast Guards and navies to combat piracy, for example. Another example is that Japan supported and helped to shape the establishment of the East Asian Summit, EAS, in 2005, despite U.S. opposition. Japan succeeded in getting um, India included as members. So it already by 2005, even before Abe becomes prime minister, Japan is able to kind of reshape EAS to have almost more of an Indo-Pacific. Um, now, Japan uh, also made and supported proposals that expanded the involvement of defense ministries and uh, uniformed uh, military officers in the ARF and contributed to the establishment uh, of the ASEAN Defense Ministers plus, dial, uh, plus Dialogue Partners in 2010, the so-called ADMM Plus. Japan made a couple of initiatives uh, towards establishing a defense minister, uh, minister, uh, defense ministry centric security dialogue because ARF, of course, is foreign ministry uh, centric. And there, there are good reasons why you'd want to have a defense ministry um, centric uh, dialogue with greater involvement of, of militaries as well. Um, and the NOTA administration uh, that preceded the Abe administration used the ARF to build support for a proposal to. Ex um, uh, to build support for its proposal, uh, Japan's initiative to establish an expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum, or EAMF, 
which was uh, accepted and created in 2012. So you had an ASEAN maritime um, forum, just like you had an ASEAN defense ministers meeting uh, that focused on maritime issues and in part also dealt with issues in the South China Sea, including the, uh, the uh, uh, establishment of a, or uh, conclusion with China of a code of conduct to go uh, govern conduct uh, by uh, countries with territorial claims in the South China Sea. And uh, uh, Japan uh, want, uh, used this initiative to give itself uh, something of a seat at the table along with other dialogue partners such as the United States. Um, so this was actually uh, also a, a quite successful proposal by Japan and one that has not gotten as much attention as I think it deserves. Now Japan, Japan has also played a leading role in promoting uh, Northeast Asian three, what I call Northeast Asian three, that's my own term, trilateral cooperation is also uh, the organization sometimes just known as the trilateral organization um, that obviously includes China, Japan, and South Korea. Um, Japan also successfully added security to the um, APT agenda, ASEAN plus three agenda in 2000. So oh, kind of reviewing my argument overall, I, I'd argue that Japan has used RSM to create a legitimate voice for itself in regional security issues. And Japan has used the ARF and other RSM institutions to successfully reassure various countries, which then paves the way for the establishment of bilateral uh, security partnerships, uh, some of which are now effectively uh, being used uh, as a counter to China. The leading examples are the Philippines, uh, the Viet uh, Vietnam, and to a lesser extent, Indonesia, where you've had very extensive Coast Guard, bilateral Coast Guard cooperation, uh, expanding into naval cooperation, even expanding into some trans of uh, military systems from Japan to the Philippines. Now, and uh, again, Japan has used RSM for um, some of these secondary motivations I mentioned, particularly creating these new security utilities such as RECAP, and it's done so with, uh, out, um, and it's been able to do so without provoking threat perception. And so before the RECAP uh, initiative, Japan had actually proposed unilateral and bilateral counter piracy initiatives, but these were rebuffed. This is also useful for joint, for military exchanges and military training, joint training regarding so-called humanitarian disaster relief operations, HADR. Uh, and uh, the ARF itself has sponsored joint military exercises for HADR, the so-called index exercises. Uh, and the ADMM plus more recently has done that as well. Now, uh, RSM has also provided a platform for balancing against China and countering Chinese efforts to isolate Japan. So, for example, when uh, China started using the ARF and getting some uh, ASEAN members to join it and kind of criticizing U.S. Uh, and uh, U.S. and Japanese missile defense plans in the late 90s, uh, you know, Japan was able to use the um, ARF to kind of counterbalance that. And there's also had some value for the kind of more traditional uh, common or collect or cooperative security roles such as reducing the threat of conflict mostly through through strengthening certain CBMs joint military exercises for HADR may play that role in some sense also uh, defense paper uh, defense white paper transparency which Japan itself has been the leading champion of within us in the ARF and um, uh, you know, there have been criticisms about how the quality of, of these papers and particularly from China but I, I, I cite a study that and seen some evidence that actually over time, even China's uh, white paper transparency has improved significantly. Now, um, so it's also a tool for in ensuring continued US engagement. I wanna pause here or just spend a little time on this because this is not very well understood. The ARF um, and the ADMM Plus uh, act for US policymakers, particularly secretaries of state and defense as uh, officials in Washington told me as so-called one-stop shopping. Um, and they facilitate trips to East Asia that would be much less frequent uh, in their absence. American elites to continue to be overwhelmingly uh, oriented towards Europe and the Middle East. And, um, but these visits can draw secretaries of defense and state out for meetings uh, pretty regularly. Uh, and also other top elites. Uh, also, the Shangri-La Dialogue has, the, has that role as well. So uh, you can have up to two uh, Secretary of Defense trips out to East Asia a year because of that. 
So, and this allows U.S. elites to better understand re the regional security environment. Their kind of default uh, setting for a regional security forum is NATO. And as one official, uh, former defense official told me, you know, when you go to ASEAN, the first thing you realize is ASEAN is not NATO. And he also mentioned the fact they make them wear these various interesting shirts and that sort of thing. But it's useful for getting to know the, uh, the local uh, uh, culture, political culture, security culture, et cetera. So in conclusion, uh, Japan's 1991 pivot away from regional security isolationism turned Japan into the most consistent champion of regional security multilateralism. It allows Japan to play a security role without provoking threat, per the threat perceptions of neighboring countries. It has helped, I would argue, to reduce those threat perceptions over time. Uh, again, the Philippines uh, in particular is a good example of that, facilitating bilateral security cooperation. It helps to ensure continued U.S. regional uh, engagement, as I just mentioned, and helps to provide, you know, these uh, new security utilities that are not provided by the U.S.-Japan alliance or are underprovided, and which Japan could not really provide on its own. And this is just a uh, this is a figure from the concluding chapter that just shows Japan's involvement in regional security multilateralism and uh, political and security multilateralism, and its first kind of role as an initiator is with the ASEAN PMC in 1978. And then as you can see, it's an initiator or co-initiator of most initiatives. Um, so my final kind of conclusion is that um, it's a mistake to suggest that Japan is refocused on the US alliance due to uh, disillusionment with the ARF or uh, regional security multilateralism, uh, not only because the claims of disillusionment, I argue, are exaggerated, but because Japan never uh, in the beginning or ever has seen the ARF as an alliance substitute. It's always seen it as playing a very different role in regional security. Now, although Japan's reputed initial exuberance about the ARF uh, receded after a few years uh, to some extent, uh, what was revealed underneath was a consistent and long-term commitment to making incremental progress and in promoting uh, cooperative security through the ARF and um, other goals as well. So, and uh, Japan has consistently supported uh, the ARF's gradual institution institutionalization and deepening, and of course, related forms like the ADMM+. I'd also pause here to say, Japan has consistently support supported ASEAN centrality in regional security multilateralism. And that is expressed, again, through the ARF and the ADMM+. Um, and even when the ARF has appeared to work more to China's advantage, this has not reduced Japan's in, uh, interest in the ARF, but rather has reduced its expectations about making political gains while simultaneously increasing MOFA's priority in using the ARF defensively. So in other words, you know, a, uh, security multilateralism isn't only about, you know, what have you done for me recently, it's also about using it defensively to uh, avoid losses as well as try to make gains. So with that, I'll end it. Thank you for listening. And I also mentioned, as you can see here, um, the book is on sale already. Uh, and outside of the Western Hemisphere, if you go to this combined academic uh, website, you can there's a uh, there's a discount code for 30% off. And if you're in the Western Hemisphere and you go to um, use this uh, uh, other code, you can go to uh, uh, Stanford University Press and actually get a 40% discount. That'll end. Thank you very much for listening. Paul, uh, thank you so much for, for a really uh, great presentation. I think you've done some really impressive research uh, in, in writing this book, and I encourage everyone in the audience to, to uh, buy it or borrow it from a library. Uh, and um, I will leave the word to Ulf now for some comments and questions to Paul. Uh, and uh, we already got some questions in the Q&A, so whenever you have a question, just write it there and then later on in the Q&A session, I will, I will post the question to you. Uh, now I leave the floor to you, Ulf, please. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your uh, presentation, Paul. Um, so I, uh, I have only read the introduction and uh, the conclusion of your book. Uh, uh, so what I'm going to say now and the comments I'm going to make uh, are, of course, based on what I've learned there and also what you presented today. Um, 
but I, I, I have to say, even though I have just skimmed through the uh, empirics of your book, uh, it, it is really impressive, uh, the amount of work you have done and um, the, uh, the source material you've used, the interviews and unclassified sources. Uh, I think uh, uh, no one can criticize you for the, uh, for the research in, in the book. Uh, I think that's very impressive. So um, this is how I understood you know, your uh, argument. Uh, you basically asked the question, why has Japan moved from isolationism during the Cold War uh, towards uh, what you call regional uh, security, multilateralism in the post-Cold War? And <clears throat> you have um, the, the, the primary um, explanatory factor in your framework is reassurance. Uh, actually both during the Cold War and also after the end of the Cold War. So during the Cold War reassurance, uh, isolationism provided one form of reassurance that Japan would not again threaten the, uh, the region. Um, whereas after the end of the Cold War, um, Japan had sort of outgrown um, the, uh, or it had become sufficiently powerful and economically uh, strong so that uh, the bilateral alliance with the United States could no longer provide that reassurance and therefore it had to seek reassurance through these multilateral uh, functions or frameworks. And in, in addition to that, you also mentioned uh, mitigation of uh, alliance security dilemma and, and, and the fact that multilateral um, frameworks offer things that Japan can't get through the bilateral alliance. But I think reassurance is the main uh, explanatory framework or factor in your framework. Now, uh, since we are at uh, the uh, Swedish Institute of International Affairs, uh, where most of the J Japan scholars are leaning towards constructivism and they are um, also uh, very much, um, you know, harping on these identity uh, factors and identity explanations. Um, I wanted to, to just ask you about how your framework uh, can relate to uh, identity explanations. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. Um, so, because in, in your book, you actually mentioned four other alternative explanations, which you then uh, refute. But among those four explanations, um, there is no real uh, constructivist explanation of, of uh, the phenomenon that, that you are explaining uh, in your book. So I think um, the constructivist or, or uh, identity explanation to uh, the move or transition from isolationism to uh, multilateralism uh, would be that there was, and, and you did actually mention a little bit about this in the presentation, but it was only a side note. Uh, uh, the identity explanation would of course be that it's, it's not really the external environment that has uh, shaped uh, Japan's, uh, you know, uh, embrace of, uh, well, both um, isolationism and uh, multilateralism, rather it is uh, national identity uh, and you know a kind of identity that is centered on pacifism, maybe pacifism is too strong a word, maybe anti-militarism is better, um, but at any, way, any rate some kind of normative commitment to peace um, and that this was really strong in, in um, uh, the Cold War Japan uh, but at the end of the Cold War, for various reasons, um, this identity came under a lot of criticism um, because of things like the Gulf War shock when Japan was heavily criticized for, you know, not contributing enough to the Gulf War. And this could also be interpreted as an attack on that pacifist identity. And also the fact that basically the uh, Socialist Party, which had been the champion of the pacifist identity, uh, more or less collapsed in the middle of the 1990s. Um, so from an, a constructivist perspective, this move from isolationism to multilateralism um, 
would probably be explained by the fact that the pacifist identity uh, weakened after the end of the Cold War. And not only that, but also that it became replaced with a more kind of assertive national identity, more realist national, national identity or uh, normal country identity where Japan was expected to do uh, the same things that other countries uh, could do. Um, so I just wonder, uh, since this is not something uh, that it seems that you touch on in, in your book, how does your argument uh, relate to these constructivist uh, explanations? Um, and uh, do they clash with them or are they supplementary in, it, in any way? Uh, so I'd just like to hear your opinion on, um, yeah, the, the connection between your argument and the more uh, standard constructivist argument. So that's the first point. Um, the second point is about uh, your um, main explanatory factor, namely reassurance, um, and especially reassurance during the Cold War, uh, which you argue led to isolationism. Uh, I think I, I completely agree that um, reassuring Japan's neighbors was absolutely key to Japanese uh, policy making during, um, the, uh, during the Cold War. Um, however, I would also add that I don't think the reassurance, um, that reassurance was only aimed at uh, other countries. I think reassurance was also aimed to some extent uh, at Japan's own population. Um, especially in the 1970s when uh, fears about remilitarization grew stronger, not only in Japan's neighboring countries, but also in Japan itself. Uh, and for various reasons, for example, you had uh, Nakazone Yasuhiro, who is known as a relatively hawkish figure becoming the, um, um, the general director of the Japan Defense Agency. And he started talking about um, um, you know, uh, autonomous defense and taking on a more international role. Uh, so kind of unusual words for a director general in the JDA. Uh, and 1970 is also the year when uh, Japan publishes its first uh, JDA white paper, which could be interpreted as, uh, you know, taking a bigger role in, ter in terms of uh, military matters. And also by 1970, Japan had already become the third largest economy in the world. So there were no longer, uh, you know, economic constraints on Japan becoming a military great power. It could if it wanted to. So it was basically these normative constraints that, um, that people outside and inside Japan had to rely on um, to ensure that Japan did not, you know, return to militarism or, or something like that. Um, and actually, I found a, a really interesting statistic uh, in one of your earlier books, uh, your 2011 book on public opinion, uh, where you uh, actually um, provide a statistic, a public opinion poll from Mainichi Shimbun uh, from 1971, which I think is quite remarkable because it shows that in 1971, 63% uh, of the Japanese people believe that Japan uh, believe that militarism was revived or was in the process of being revived. Um, so I mean 63 percent of the entire population is is huge. Um, so my point is simply that uh, especially in the 1970s um, reassurance was not simply aimed at uh, so things like for example you mentioned uh, the Fukuda doctrine doctrine yes of course it was aimed at uh, other countries but I think also to a pretty large extent it was aimed at uh, Japan's own population which also had um, begin or, or was beginning to have uh, you know serious concerns about the potential for remilitarization of their own country. So yeah, it's not really a question. You can expand on that if you, if you want to, but I, and my point is simply that I think reassurance is not only external, but also internal. Um, my third comment is, I'm not gonna talk so much uh, for my next comments, but my, my third comment is that um, um, 
it seems like your analysis is pretty uh, elite centered. Uh, so uh, we are seeing, um, you know, we, we're learning about all the policymakers and we're learning about all these networks of um, epistemic communities that inspire Japan, um, but uh, seemingly absent is, um, you know, Japanese uh, public attitudes, um, public opinion, basically, which I thought was uh, a little bit surprising, given that I uh, know you best for your work on uh, public opinion. That's uh, that's um, sort of been your uh, strong point uh, among many others. Uh, so, so I was a little bit, uh, you know, uh, curious as to whether you think that this transition from isolationism to multilateralism was simply an, a, a top-down, you know, top-down induced uh, phenomenon, or uh, did also um, public opinion, public attitude, like normal people's attitudes towards uh, the self-defense forces or towards uh, foreign policy, security policy, did they also play a role? Um, so that would be my, my third comment. My four, um, fourth and final comment um, is, um, yeah, si simply um, now in the, you know, age of the coronavirus, um, of course, you, you couldn't I, I wouldn't expect you to include anything about the coronavirus in your book because, I mean, we, we're living through it. But now, after you know finishing your book and and having gone through uh, this very tumultuous 2020, do you think in any way that the coronavirus could impact uh, Japan's, uh, you know, uh, regional security or approach to regional uh, security multi? lateralism in any way. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, those are my comments and yeah, you can you can choose to uh, answer uh, those comments you see fit. So thank you. Thank you very much Ulf, for opening up the discussion in such an inspired and constructive way. So I will let uh, Paul take some time to respond to those uh, questions and comments before we move on to the Q&A. Okay, thank you. Yeah, those are very detailed um, and thoughtful comments. Um, and uh, I'll try to respond as best I can. Regarding your, your question about constructivism, I guess I see the, the, the kind of uh, constructivist questions you raise about Japan's identity as um, more probably more complementary than anything to the argument I'm making. Um, I mean, the, the my reassurance theory really derives from uh, from realism, from Stephen Wald's balance of threat theory and the idea that states balance against others that appear to be uh, harbor aggressive intentions. And if that's true, then states have an incentive to reassure that they don't have them. Um, now, I think he argued in his second book that, you know, you could use constructivism to help explain how states view uh, the, pers uh, the uh, intentions of other states, although he doesn't go there and I, I don't really go there. In effect, that's kind of a hole in this theory. You can kind of plug any theory of perception into that you want to. Uh, I tend to look at past behavior uh, as the most important uh, factor. Now, past behavior such as Japan's expansionism up to 1945 can then in regionally and domestically perhaps become kind of hardened into what you would call norms uh, about behavior. Uh, that may be true, um, but I, I tend to focus on sort of more the issue of kind of trust or mistrust based on, uh, or perceptions of intentions based on previous behavior, which I don't think is necessarily at all inconsistent with constructivism, but it's just kind of another, a, a different way to approach it. Um, um, in terms of uh, isol, and I guess also in terms of isolationism, um, and some other work recently, I've also been arguing that we do have kind of a recurrent isolationism in Japan. You can, of course, makes a lot of sense to think about that in terms of constructivism. I also tend to think of that more directly, perhaps also just related to the kind of material environment, the fact Japan is an island and, uh, and how that in, impacts the way it looks at itself. But um, I agree that might be, con you could use constructivism to get that, get at that. Um, I uh, also, Take uh, Fukuda Takeo, you know, promoted this idea as Japan, uh, as this great experiment. He talks about this in the Fukuda Doctrine and in speeches before then this great experiment, this economic power that chooses not to become 
a, uh, a great military power. And you can see that uh, as a kind of a, a peace state identity. I, I found in the documents related to the Nakayama proposal, one mention of Japan supposedly being a peace state in quotation marks. So I, I wasn't sure how, whether they were being skeptical or not, but um, there is a little bit of that. But, um, but I think overall, when I look at, you know, the research I found was that there was a, a focus on, you know, how do we reassure just the practical nuts and bolts issues of how do we reassure other Asian countries as we begin to expand our military role. So that's the first uh, question and probably the most difficult for me to answer. The second point you raise, reassurance is also aimed at Japan's own population. I, I couldn't agree more and I think I, I think I said that in this book uh, and if I didn't, I'm pretty sure I said it in my earlier book, um, that, that indeed the same measures that can reassure other countries can also be uh, used to reassure Japan's own population. That said, regional security multilateralism itself um, and this sort of gets to your um, third question, uh, is not something that really registers in public opinion. That's why I don't really uh, discuss public opinion much in this book, and that's why it's mostly an elite-driven phenomenon. I mean, the, the cabinet office um, does has a polling unit. They do a regular poll about jiotai ni kansuru yoron chosa, so a, a poll on, on the uh, Japanese self-defense forces. And after the Cold War, they started adding a few questions about security multilateralism. They get answers. They basically show that, you know, the uh, Japanese support participation in security dialogues and other forms of security multilateralism. And these questions are not asking about security multilateralism in terms of like using force, which is quite different. So my previous book was focusing on cases where uh, 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 you know, issues where, uh, that are very salient to the public, like sending the SDF overseas and getting involved in combat and suffering and in inflicting casualties. That's an area where public opinion matters a lot. But, you know, should we have a security dialogue in the PMC or not? Or what should be the shape of the ARF or the ADM and plus? That just doesn't register that much in domestic politics. It's a very, you know, it's, it's not a very salient issue and it's very detailed. And that's why I think this tends to be more of an elite driven phenomenon. This is elites matter here because they're the ones who really pay attention to this. Even politicians don't get very, very involved in this. Um, politicians, there was some reaction to the Nakayama proposal. Because, uh, there was some negative uh, reactions from ASEAN and the US. Um, but, um, you know, this tended to be very much elite driven. There's sort of a debate about whether Nakayama himself had some influence on the proposal that bears his name or not. Uh, he actually did have, in some small respects, uh, other areas, some influence. I won't get into that. But, but by and large, this was really driven by Sato Yukio and by the bureaucrats in the foreign ministry. Uh, I, I would also add that Miyazawa was, was an exception in terms of really pushing this issue as well. Um, but it tended not only to be elite focused, but really bu uh, focused on the bureaucracy of the foreign ministry. Uh, COVID-19 impact. I'm obviously, as you say, we're in the middle of it. I'm not sure what impact it will have. But, you know, one thing, a message I think I, I make is that non-traditional security is where regional security multilateralism has had its biggest impact. And I mentioned, again, these security utilities, I should have said non-traditional security utilities you cannot get from the alliance or from other places either. And I think greater cooperation in terms of combating pandemics. I think maybe in one of the last iterations and doing the, uh, the page proofing, maybe I even added pan pandemic, fighting pandemics, or maybe it was there before. But, um, but that is an area of, of non-traditional security where uh, even militaries can cooperate. I mean, I, I'd written an op-ed piece a couple years ago advocating with, with a co-authored one, advocating sending the SDF to West Africa to fight Ebola, which unfortunately didn't happen even though many other countries sent their militaries. So even if you're talking about involving militaries or just in other respects, COVID-19 or counter pandemic policy is a non-traditional security area <coughs> where the ARF or the ADMM plus and some of these other forms could play a real role or we could see a, a specialized organization like RECAP established. I think that concludes what I have to say. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. So uh, we have a little over uh, 30 minutes for uh, discussion together with the audience. And I thank everyone who posed questions too far. And 
uh, we have we have a number, but I think it will be room for even more. So please don't hesitate if you uh, wonder about something. And I think most of the question concerns uh, Paul's book. So so I will post them to Paul. But of course, all if you feel like chipping in, uh, you are very uh, welcome to do so. Um, so uh, the first question is from uh, Magnus Robach. And it concerns this balance between like-minded and unlike-minded approaches when it comes to which countries to include in different regional initiatives from Japan. And um, uh, Magnus relates this to uh, the DPJ uh, government uh, in 2009 and the first prime minister from uh, the DPJ, uh, Hatoyama Yukio, and his foreign minister, Okada Katsuya. Uh, and they uh, proposed then a so-called East Asian community, right, uh, as uh, an aspiration for multilateralism in the region. And this was very clearly a non-like-minded vision, right? This was open to all countries and also China. And of course, there was a lot of discussion at that time because uh, a general impression was that the United States as a non Asian country wouldn't be included in this uh, community. So the question is then, how do you, Paul, view the current Japanese debate on the balance between like-minded and unlike-minded approaches? That, that's a very good question. I don't spend a lot of time on the Hatoyama uh, proposal because I don't think it was really fleshed out. And I even was, I think in my own mind, maybe excessively, thinking it might end up being as much an, ec an example of economic multilateralism as political or security. So I didn't spend a lot of time on that. And of course, my book, I don't really focus on economic multilateralism, even though and this is a point I, I might just make, which is Japan was a security isolationist during the Cold War, but it was very enthusiastic with, for example, the Asian Development Bank in promoting regional economic multilateralism. So I, I that's something I don't really focus on. But in terms of this, balance between like-minded and unlike-minded? That's a good question, particularly today. There's also another concept that I, I um, talk about in the book, which is mini-lateralism, which is bringing in uh, basically allies to form kind of small core groups. And of course, today, the, the so-called quad involving Japan, Australia, India, and the US might be an example of that. And you know, I suppose we can ask the question, which matters more? Um, that said, again, in terms of like-minded or unlike-minded or multilateralism versus minilateralism, the definitions can be, you know, kind of be very, end up being very hair-splitting. I'm not even sure I'm ready to say that uh, the quad is uh, minilateralism or even entirely like-minded, partly because India in particular seems a bit uh, unclear whether they, it's unclear whether they want to use that as like a balancing forum for kind of security cooperation to actively balance China, how much they want to do that and how much they want to kind of maintain their non-aligned status. Uh, again, if you go back to the Nakayama proposal, uh, Japan tended to treat ASEAN as though it were, uh, the diplomats in the foreign ministry often treated ASEAN as though as an extension of the US-Japan alliance or you know, uh, the Western alliance. Uh, and one reason they ran into trouble was, was uh, Indonesia decidedly did not uh, agree with that idea at all. And they were one of the main opponents of just having a like-minded security dialogue. And I think today too, I mean, India, I think, uh, is not necessarily uh, a like-minded country. Now, you know, there have been more tensions with China recently that might have changed. I, I, I can't really say, but, um, but yeah, there is certainly been a debate. But I also think that um, I argue in the book that even though Abe has a, a reputation, uh, late recent Prime Minister Abe, for promoting uh, minilateralism and alliance cooperation, that even he has continued to promote uh, more broader, unlike-minded regional security multilateralism. At Shangri-La, about five years ago, he proposed strengthening the kind of crisis management uh, capabilities of the East Asian Summit, particularly the ambassadors who are uh, assigned to ASEAN headquarters to deal related to the East Asian Summit. So he uh, proposed strengthening uh, uh, the uh, EAS's kind of security uh, framework. And Japan has continued to be a consistent and active supporter. And finally, I'd add that actually, um, the Indo-Pacific concept itself actually at works to help uh, uh, strengthen ASEAN's role as the central pivot in that region, and also even the ARF. 
the biggest criticism I heard of the ARF is it just has too many members. It has more members than any other organization except the UN. And, it, and often they would focus on the fact, well, it includes you know, countries that don't really matter to East Asia, like Pakistan or Bangladesh, um, et cetera, and maybe Sri Lanka, I don't know. And uh, the idea is that you know, these don't re aren't really that relevant for our region. But when you expand the region in to include the Indian Ocean, suddenly they become a lot more relevant and important. And in some ways, I think that makes the ARF more relevant than it was maybe a decade ago. Thank you, Paul. And we have the next question from an unnamed attendee. Uh, so would you say that uh, Japan's connections with the United States has weakened uh, as a result of the ASEAN Regional Forum? Oh, no, I, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, now, again, as I said, uh, uh, James Baker's initial reaction to the Nakayama proposal was quite negative. I mean, a skeptic would say he doesn't like a proposal that he doesn't propose, but um, he, uh, he was pretty, uh, he was negative, but he was brought around within a few months. Uh, a few months later, he came to Tokyo and was saying more positive things, and the Clinton administration was, in some ways, ended up being more positive about the ARF at one stage than even Japan. So no, the, the US has been an enthusiastic participant. And I would say, I went to Washington three years ago uh, for interviews for this book, and I was expecting to hear you know, Asian hands in Washington say, eh, who cares about regional security multilateralism? It's all about hub and spokes. I pretty much found the opposite, actually. I heard people saying, you know, it's not the hub and spokes anymore. It's, uh, they, they talked about, used a slightly different term, like you know, uh, coalitions of like-minded countries. But they were all very enthusiastic about regional security multilateralism and Japan's role in promoting it. Um, and they were also surprisingly uh, supportive about uh, uh, even the ARF, and, and, uh, but also the uh, uh, ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. They thought it was a very useful forum. They thought they could use it sometimes to balance against China uh, and to kind of build regional coalitions. Um, they pointed out that the, the, the government, the, that the Bush administration George W. Bush took the ARF more seriously than the Clinton administration because they saw it as the only platform in the region for coordinating counterterrorism policy. So, in fact, I think the U.S. is more supportive of um, regional security multilateralism than is often uh, uh, realized. And, uh, and I, I didn't find anyone who was opposed to Japan playing a leadership role. In fact, they all tended to support it. Uh, also, because as some of them pointed out, and as I found in my book, sometimes the U.S., because it has it's kind of a problem with um, attention, you know, it has to focus on so many different regions at a time, even policy experts in the State Department don't often have a very fine-grained view of what's going on in East Asia, and Japan often has a better view. So in that sense, uh, you know, I, I, there was some recognition that letting Japan take the leadership role on this makes a lot of sense because they kind of are in a better position to know what to do in the region. Right, thanks. And a follow-up question for me then, uh, would you see that this uh, U.S. attitude toward regional security multilateralism in East Asia and Japan's role therein, uh, has, then, has that been subject to change during the Trump administration? And, and the second leg of the question, do, do you see this as a bipartisan consensus today in Washington? In other words, no matter whether uh, Trump is re-elected or whether we will see a Biden administration, this general U.S. attitude will, will be uh, intact? Well, I, I admit that when I interviewed uh, policymakers in Washington, mostly interviewing people who had retired from the uh, Obama administration recently, but I w also talked to some uh, one person in the State Department. And, and, but, but basically, the message I got from regarding the Trump administration, to put it crudely, which is probably the best way to put it, is economic multilateralism, bad. Security multilateralism, good. So they're actually quite comfortable and happy with these forums. Um, of course, they are particularly promoting the Quad, although I notice even the number two official at the State Department, Mr. Begun, has been cautious about whether, you know, how far we can develop um, the Quad. But um, no, the, I, I, the, uh, you know, in a second Trump administration, there are people like John Bolton say, well, maybe Trump will want to end the U.S.-Japan alliance. Maybe, but, you know, the cost to the U.S. in participating in the ARF or the ADMM plus, I mean, it's it's two sec. It's you know, visits by secretaries of state and and, and defense, and I I that's a low enough price that it's not going to be there very politically 
controversial and and it's just not again this is not something that registers in in domestic public opinion i have never seen a presidential debate where the word ASEAN or ARF comes up. It just does not register. So um, I, I don't see it becoming a, a controversial issue. And I, I see the US continuing to want to use, even in a, another Trump administration, I mean, as much as we can predict what the heck would happen in a second Trump administration, um, uh, and especially in a Biden administration, uh, continued US engagement in regional security multilateralism. Again, mostly to serve their interests as a way to kind of, kind of, uh, perhaps balance against China, maybe build regional alliances, but maybe also, you know, um, work on mechanisms for kind of reducing threat, uh, accidental war, and also, you know, there is again this code of conduct that ASEAN and China have been negotiating forever. The U.S. and Japan want to have a voice in that, and that could become something important. Um, so, you know, I could see the U.S. engaging on that. Uh, right, M makes sense. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, and then uh, the next question then uh, redirects our attention to the Japanese perspective. Uh, a question is from uh, Richard Shea. Uh, which other countries is Japan thinking to share leadership with in its regional security mul multilateralism? Okay, that's a good question. Um, you know, one thing I have to say that I've been worried about when I reflect on my book is that it is well, it is openly and consciously Japan-centric. And uh, I'm afraid someone is going to say, well, you're shortchanging what Korea did or what some other country did. And that may be true um, because I'm just focusing on Japan. But I, I don't think Japan has been uh, negative about sharing leadership, say, with South Korea, or even in some cases, if it came to it, maybe China uh, or, or certainly the US. So I think they're willing to share leadership. I'm focusing on what Japan has done. Uh, but for example, in you know, the East Asian uh, summit, you know, Malaysia played a big role, China played a big role, South Korea played a big role. Um, and I do discuss that a little bit. Um, but I, I, I don't see them having a problem kind of sharing leadership on these initiatives. I mean, in fact, uh, and, and in fact, that was an interesting kind of lesson they learned from the Nakayama proposal. One reason you got a negative reaction from ASEAN is because ASEAN basically wants to be the one to propose anything regarding an ASEAN institution. They don't want it coming from outside of ASEAN. So although Japan, uh, and, and Japan has been more careful about that, with the partial exception of the expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum, which was from Japan and which was accepted, uh, even with less controversy than, you know, met the Nakayama proposal. But I do think Japan today is uh, uh, more careful to coordinate with ASEAN behind the scenes rather than coming out and making a public speech about, or a public statement about creating a new ASEAN organization for the most part. Mm, right, thank you. Uh, so I think we will have time for all the questions. So, so I'm um, posing them in, in a reverse order now since we got a uh, question posed to Ulm specifically, uh, also from uh, Magnus Robach. So the uh, World Value Survey recently asked about fear of war. In Japan, 84% of respondents feared war, and what's more, 43% even feared civil war. So how to understand this? Is this an expression of fear of a resurging militarism in Japan? What's your take, Ulf? And obviously Ulf, for, for those that don't know, has doing a lot of research on this kind of identity issues in Japan related to uh, anti-militarism and militarism as well. Yeah, actually, that was the first time I saw those numbers. Uh, those are surprising and especially surprising, I think, civil war, uh, because I don't see any uh, likelihood of civil war. I assume uh, that means civil war in Japan. Um, and and uh, war, the, the civil war, just to go back to, to that, because I, I think um, if you go back to some of the most controversial um, uh, you know, uh, decisions in terms of security policy that have been made in Japan the, in recent years, which could potentially spur, uh, you know, partisan divide uh, somewhat similar to what you see in the United States would be the 2015, uh, you know, decision to uh, enact or allow collective self-defense. And, and that indeed did, you know, 
spur some demonstrations but i mean there's nothing close to anything like like civil war so so those um fears are kind of a mystery to me um and i i don't really know what drives the fear of war i haven't really looked at public opinion on fear of, of war in japan um but it's kind of stunning if you if you look at it in a in a bigger perspective in a in a long term perspective because during the uh, cold war when there really was perhaps uh you know uh, some reason to fear war um the threat perceptions were relatively low in in japan compared to in other countries uh so today uh when at least how how i see it the the you know if there is such a thing as an a, you know uh objective risk of war uh, would be lower than during the cold war it's kind of surprising to see that you know the numbers are so high <clears throat> but i i guess it might you know it, it might be because of um china uh, north korea is always you know a, a constantly um uh, a constant topic in in security discussions and and i think uh, ever since uh, the it was revealed in the early 2000s that North Korea indeed was behind the abductions of of Japanese citizens. Um, <clears throat> public opinion seems to have, you know, shifted dramatically, and and, and threat perceptions in general have have gone up uh, because it's become such an you know emotional issue now. Uh, so North Korea is always there. Uh, it doesn't help that now they they're you know nuclear. Um, capabilities are, are strengthening. And uh, on top of that, you have a you know, constantly growing China. So, I mean, those are kind of uh, standard explanations, I think, but I can't really think of anything better than, than those reasons for why we see such high, uh, you know, uh, fears of, of war in Japan. Uh, I don't know, Paul, since you're the public opinion expert here, maybe you have right, some right. sophisticated I, I, take on it. I, I can just mention as well, I think we got a clarification here in the uh, Q&A column from Magnus as well, and he writes that the numbers are from 2010. 2010. Um, okay, but that, that, so, I mean, then you, you of course, uh, had, uh, you know, various crises. Uh, I mean, you had the two North Korean attacks uh, against uh, South Korea and, and tensions were flaring up uh, over the Senkaku um, Islands. So I think 2010 is kind of an outlier um, because there were so many, um, you know, exceptional security um, occurrences in, in Japan's uh, proximity. So, so that might be some of the explanation. Yeah, I, I might just add that in my sense, looking at public opinion in Japan is there tends to be a very high baseline of angst about almost anything. So one thing I focus on, if you look at, if you ask uh, opinion polls of Japanese, are you worried about violent crime? Japanese often are, uh, more Japanese are worried about being a victim of violent crime than are Americans, even though the violent crime rate in Japan is vastly lower than in the US. And I think that just reflects the fact, I mean, I, to put it crudely, I mean, in most of these things, when you ask Japanese, are you worried about X or Y, uh, compared to the US and many other countries, they just tend to worry more about everything, uh, just as a baseline. So I think that might offer some partial explanation. I, I also follow up to my 2011 book. I did a, a, a chapter for a, an edited volume on the ground self-defense forces, and I have some charts in there from the cabinet. Uh, the cabinet office's uh, regular poll on the SDF. And what I find there is there I, I, I track like, uh, you know, uh, uh, fear of being entrapped in a war. And it does seem to, in a graph, and it does actually, I think it does respond to real world events. So uh, as the Cold War was winding down and ending, it fell a lot. And then with the North Korean missile threat emerging, it goes up again. So, but it does, as, as Ulf, I think, was saying, it does respond, I think, to kind of real world uh, developments. But it probably starts at a higher level, uh, base level than in many other countries. Mm. Uh, thanks to both of you. Uh, and then the next question uh, sort of uh, returns to regional security multilateralism. It's a very good question from John Hennessy. Uh, and it 
also relates to the discussion we had earlier about the DPJ administration, non-LDP administration, which is quite rare in Japan. So the question is that during the period you have studied, uh, Paul, uh, obviously non-LDP cabinets didn't have much time to enact dramatic mm -hmm. policy change. Mm -hmm. However, did they adopt the same approach as the LDP cabinet? toward the secu uh, regional security multilateralism. Right. Well, I mean, uh, uh, we were talking about the Hatoyama um, proposal for an East Asian uh, uh, community. Um, that might be, that could be, although I don't think it was really fleshed out, the, the possible uh, example of a very different policy, but he didn't st uh, stay in office very long. Frankly, my impression is, that, or my, my belief is that Khan and, and Noda in particular pursued policies that in some ways were not that different from traditional LDP policies. In fact, you could argue that they were quite traditional LDP policies. And then when Abe came in, he pursued policies that were well to the right of what the uh, LDP had been pursuing up to that point. Um, and in fact, in many ways, I, I argue that uh, uh, nonetheless, despite that, that in some of these issues like the South China Sea um, and uh, regional security, Ironically, the Abe administration ended up following some of the policies laid down by the NOTA administration, like the security, uh, strategic partnership, and, and, and naval, and, and particularly Coast Guard cooperation with the Philippines and with Vietnam. That starts under the DPJ. Um, so I'm not sure I see a very big difference in terms of regional security multilateralism. Again, one of the most, I think, impressive and understudied successes of Japan is, is the creation of this expanded uh, uh, ASEAN Maritime Forum in 2011-2012 under uh, NOTA's initiative. But um, yeah, the, I, and, and as you point out that, yeah, the non-LDP cabinets have not had a lot of time to act, but um, I don't see a big difference. And again, this gets back to the point that particularly in the early 90s, and I think even today, this policy tends to be, policy towards regional multilateralism is often dominated by the foreign ministry. And has a continuity of, uh, to the extent there is continuity within the ministry and its bureaucrats. Right. Thank you. Uh, so we have two questions now from uh, Marianne Lanazza, and she also thanks you, Paul, for an excellent presentation. I can only second that. And this is uh, a bit long, so I think I read it to not get something wrong here. Uh, so, uh, quote here, my first question is, in an area which I have studied for a long time, and that is the connection between Japan's energy imports from the Middle East and how Japan has tried to balance between different OPEC countries during the 1980s and beginning of the 1990s, and also which impact this had on Japan's security policy, uh, policy uh, and other uh, possibly relevant aspects. So that's the first question. Okay. And then uh, Marianne's second question is about Japan and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, where Japan tried to set up its own strategy and cooperation with Central Asian countries. Um, and Marianne also mentions that since several years, she's been involved in collaboration on these issues with researchers at the Tsukuba University in Japan. Okay. Well, if you could try to respond to those two questions about the balancing between open countries and also the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Okay, um, well, um, those are excellent questions that I'm, I'm not sure I really know very much about um, regarding balancing OPEC countries. Um, I do know that Japan has tried in its diplomacy to kind of uh, present itself as a friend of the Arab world that is not the West, that it is not a Western country. I think there's a famous meeting, I believe, actually between Fukuda Takeo and Muammar Gaddafi, in which he basically, you know, the, the point that Gaddafi and or Fukuda was driving home was that, you know, we don't have a history of, conf of civilizational conflict between Japan and, and the Arab world or the Islamic world. Um, and I know that, um, for example, the, uh, there's uh, this organization of um, Islamic, um, uh, 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 of Islamic countries uh, that uh, basically recognize Japan as a, uh, a mediator in the Mindanao dispute in the southern uh, Philippines. Of course, not all OPEC countries are, are, are Islam, Islamic or Arab countries, but uh, I think Japan has tried to 
present itself in the region as, you know, tried to kind of distance itself from Western countries to some extent and, uh, and, uh, and, and build itself and kind of build itself as, as uh, you know, more, more friendly to, to, to regional concerns and interests. I think that kind of played out in the way uh, that they deployed troops to Iraq. They sent troops to Southern Iraq and somewhat kept their distance from the United States and kind of promoted their own distinct way of, of you know, uh, reconstruction and, 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 and avoided any involvement in combat for, for other reasons as well. So that, that's my kind of overall take or impression of their policy in the Middle East, which is they've tried to distance themselves uh, maybe from the U.S. and the West a little bit and pursue a bit of an independent policy. But, but balancing between Saudi Arabia and Iran, I don't know. They obviously put a lot of investment into Iran and they maintain a very good relationship with Iran. Uh, and, I, and I know Abe has tried to play a mediating role, but I, I can't really say too much beyond that. Also with Japan and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I mean, that's an, an interesting uh, organization, and it also points out that there is not only, um, you know, that besides ASEAN centrality, there are, are other non-ASEAN uh, multilateral uh, political, if not security, frameworks in a, in broader Asia, particularly in Central Asia. With and the Shanghai Cooperation Group is uh, one of the most important. Of course, Japan has had an dipl important diplomacy towards Central Asia. I remember it was particularly active, uh, or I particularly noticed it during. Uh, Prime Minister Obuchi's tenure in office, um, but I'm not really sure if I can if I can say too much about that. But I also might mention there's this other uh, regional Asian security organization that I, I, I mentioned in that table that's in my book uh, that has a Chinese name. I, I don't remember it, so I won't try to pronounce it. But um, um, that is a kind of an alternative. It's more of kind of a track two, track one point five. Uh, that may be a kind of a challenge to ASEAN centrality. Uh, by creating a non-ASEAN regional security forum. But um, uh, I, I guess another interesting question is whether Japan would ever be interested in joining the Shanghai Cooperative Cooperation Organization. I, and I'm not sure if, if they could get in or not. But um, all I can say is I, Japan is, from what I can see, remains very interested in Central Asia. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, and the next question uh, is also a bit long. I, I think I'll read it. Um, so uh, now I'm quoting, unfortunately, I have not read a book, but it surprises me a bit hearing the discussion. It surprises me a bit that there is not more discussion of Japan's participation or role in uh, the United Nations peacekeeping operations, right? Uh, so I continue reading, that is the sort of multilateral security that has been viewed most positively within Japan and it has to some extent opened the door, quote unquote, for other security multilateralism. Uh, did a discussion about the international peace cooperation law from 1992 not also influence the dialogue in Japan on regional security multilateralism? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I do discuss UN peacekeeping a little bit in the book, and in fact, I would argue that it is very closely linked to the Nakayama proposal. Japan was deciding in 1990-91, it wanted to start sending the SDF overseas to participate in UN peacekeeping, starting in Cambodia. Um, and, but it perceived a need to reassure Asian countries it would not, this would not cause Japan to emerge as a threat. And there was a lot of opposition in East Asian countries to this. There was a lot of opposition in East Asian countries to Japan sending its military to Saudi Arabia to provide rear area logistical support for the Operation uh, Desert Shield in 1990. Uh, and the Nakayama proposal, I would argue, was a major response to that, to say, to explain to Asian countries that even though Japan wants to send troops to Cambodia and other places to participate in UN peacekeeping organ operations, this does not mean that Japan is going to reemerge as a great military power or as a military threat. I think that is, uh, those two are very closely linked. Um, uh, although I would add that, that some, like actually, this is a place where I have some disagreement with uh, uh, Sato Yukio. He, he tends to not emphasize that so much. But when I look at it, that, that's what I see. I see a very clear link there. Um, and also regional security multilateralism, which focuses on non-traditional security. I think joint uh, training, cooperation uh, for peacekeepers, also the uh, uh, humanitarian disaster relief operations, uh, uh, disaster relief um, 
military exercises that have been have them held the multilateral exercises through the ARF, through the ADMM plus, uh, also linked very much to peacekeeping in terms of joint training uh, and, and uh, of, that may be relevant for peacekeeping. So, so there is some relevance there, but of course I'm focusing on the region. There is no regional peacekeeping mechanism. So, um, and also I, I, just as a broader point, it's interesting that Abe took Japan out of all unit level peacekeeping. Uh, which is a big change, and I would even call that a type of uh, uh, neo-isolationism at the level of global security, but that's that's sort of outside the range of my book. Right, uh, thank you, and uh, we sort of uh, got a comment uh, as well from Christine Ingvarsdottir, and she writes that, for instance, only about 10% of all correspondents in Japan were against PKO participation in the mid-1990s, right? Uh, 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 actually, can, can I just chime in there? Yeah, yeah. sure, um, sure. Um, yeah, there was, um, I, I make the argument, I mean, elsewhere, that, that Japan, uh, the government sold participation in PKO by making it equivalent to humanitarian disaster relief operations overseas. And when you look at what the SDF does, that's what they do. They don't engage in combat, so non-combat uh, operations. I don't know if it ever got down to 10%. I think maybe 15 or 20% was kind of the core opposition, but it became overwhelmingly popular. Um, but interestingly, it's not quite as popular recently. The, um, I think uh, there was an Iraq uh, syndrome, and mm -hmm. I think so the deployment to Iraq actually pushed down some support for UN peacekeeping after that. And more recently, the Sudan, a South Sudan deployment has also had some negative impact. And I've even seen people de holding demonstrations against deployments to South Sudan, which I was very surprised about. Mm. So there has been a little bit of, of kind of reduction in support for UN peacekeeping. But, but yes, the, the, the demonstration effect of sending the SDF to Cambodia, participating honorably and, and, and beneficially and doing good works, uh, really greatly increased support for UN peacekeeping. Uh, uh, in a non-combat non UN peacekeeping operations by the uh, SDF. Right. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everyone in the audience for, for these uh, great, uh, really excellent questions. Uh, I think they're all very, very relevant to the discussion today. So we, we have just a couple of, yeah, we have just a couple of more minutes. Um, but, uh, you know, since we have two uh, experts here, not only on uh, RSM, but also on Japan's broader foreign and security policy, I thought I would just take the opportunity to, to ask both of you about your expectations for the new uh, Suga cabinet when it comes to uh, Japan's foreign and security policy, whether it's relations with the uh, United States, with China, South Korea, Russia uh, and so on. And of course, if you read the newspapers on the new cabinet, I think the consensus is that we shouldn't perhaps expect that much change, right? We, we should expect something quite similar to, to Abe's legacy. So, so my question to uh, you two, to Paul and Ull, would then be, would you expect any change? And if so, in which particular areas or issues? So if we can just take one minute I'm making it difficult for you, but uh, please bear with me. One minute each, and then we'll wrap up after that. So if you would uh, like to start, Paul. Okay. The one thing that's missing from the new Abe cabinet, I haven't seen, maybe I've missed something, is he's not talking about constitutional reform. Now, that may come up later, but, uh, you know, he's launched the cabinet. This doesn't seem to be a big issue for him. And I think he's, now, of course, if you ask him, does he support it, he'll say yes. But I think he may be kind of uh, downplaying that as a goal and focusing on other things, uh, you know, uh, digital reform, uh, administrative reform, and he isn't really, uh, you know, reform of how much you pay for your cell phone. And I, I think he wants to focus on those issues and maybe not on some of the foreign policy issues. He also has less experience. So I expect him to continue along the broad uh, uh, track of what Abe has done, but maybe not take any new kind of bold, particularly hawkish initiatives. But right. My take. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I agree with what Paul said. I don't expect any major changes, but I think if uh, we are, or if there is any change, uh, which is of significance, it might be towards South Korea, because I think this is an excellent opportunity to kind of wind down the, the tension that was created um, under the final years of the uh, or actually during the entire Abe administration. So we might see 
a situation that's similar to the first time Abe came to power when he kind of unexpectedly reached out to China and kind of mended those fences a little bit because there was an opportunity to do so. I think for Suga, he kind of has the same opportunity now if he, if he wants to grab it. I think it's possible to kind of restart the relationship with South Korea. Um, I don't really expect him to do it, but it's, the possibility is there. So uh, if anything, that, that's yeah, something that we might uh, see in the future. Uh, thank you, Ulf. and uh, thanks again to both of you, Paul, for, for presenting your uh, new book out uh, just recently with Stanford University Press, and also <laughs> Ulf for, for th there you have the, the, the cover, so you can recognize it when you browse the bookstores. Thanks. Uh, and also to you, Ulf, for, for your uh, excellent comments, and for everyone in the audience for, for joining us today and also taking part in the discussion. And uh, please look out for uh, new uh, invitations in your inbox to upcoming uh, events in the Stockholm Seminars on Japan from UI and from our partner institutions uh, later this fall. And hope to see you again all soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. For the invitation. Goodbye. Bye.